So do they like it? Um, I think yes and no. Yeah. Out of all the places where I have hiked and I have traveled, the trail that means the most to me and the trail that's changed my life the most is the Appalachian Trail, which we were on for a little bit today. And I've actually completed the entire 2,189 mile Appalachian Trail three separate times. Now the most recent time in 2011 with my husband's help and a lot of assistance from friends and family members, I went out and I actually did the entire trail in 46 days. An average of 47 miles a day. That's crazy, right? <laughs> crazy. I mean, how many did we do today? Seven? Okay, plus 40, right? 47 miles a day. But hopefully, and today I don't even want to focus that much on the record because I think a lot of you actually have either heard about the hike or maybe heard when I presented at, Con not Concord, Concord, right? Yes. Presented at Concord. Uh, I'm giving a talk tomorrow about the endurance hike in Hanover at the library, which I would love for you to attend. But to me, the most important hike I've ever taken was the first hike. The first hike on the Appalachian Trail, which was truly my introduction to the wilderness. And that changed everything for me. And so today I wanted to focus more on, on really the first journey because that's the trip that raised so many important questions in my life. And when I set out on that first journey down the Appalachian Trail, I was 21 years old. I did not have any backpacking experience. In fact, I just had my brother's old Boy Scout gear. That's what I started with. And I, and I started all alone in Georgia. And I think people always ask, wow, why did you think you could start all alone without any experience and hike the entire Appalachian Trail? And I don't know the answer, but on the fact that I, I was 21. You know, I, I was 21 and inexperienced didn't seem to matter. And I had this great formal education. I went to a wonderful university. But when I graduated from college, I didn't know anything about the outdoors. And that really bothered me. And because I didn't know anything about the wilderness, I felt like I really didn't know myself. I felt like my internal nature was connected to the outdoors. And I needed to put the two together. So I started on my own on the Appalachian Trail. And a bit, again, being young and naive in my mind, I thought, OK, well, this is going to be an adventure. And, and it seems pretty affordable. And it'll be fun. And hiking is really just walking. So how hard can it be, right? <laughs> Youth, you got to love it. Um, and then I learned very quickly that, that hiking and backpacking was actually the hardest thing I had ever done. And I thought I had done tough stuff. I had done uh, a marathon. I had done an Ironman triathlon. But walking all day in all types of weather with blisters on your feet, a pack on your back, without creature comforts, without a support network, without friends and family, it was so difficult for me. It really was. And um, I remember pretty early on in the trip, I was actually out on the trail. When you start down in Georgia, it takes you a couple weeks to make it to the Smoky Mountain National Park. But for me as a new hiker to get to the Smokies, I was like, all right, I've done it. I've made it. I'm at the Smokies. And I knew that the Smoky Mountain National Park was actually the most visited national park in the entire country. And I figured, well, if all these folks are coming in the Smokies, there must be something we're seeing, right? So I thought I would have like great views, you know, like, like this. And, uh, and I thought I would see wildflowers and um, maybe wildlife from a safe distance, you know? Like I had high hopes for the Smokies. And then the entire time I was walking through the park, it was basically like the summit of Musilaki this morning, really. <laughs> Yeah, that's why it's called the Smokies. Yeah, foggy, misty, rainy, windy. And the Appalachian Trail has about 77 miles through the Smoky Mountain National Park. And my last night inside the park, I was staying at a trail shelter. Not a trail hut like you New Hampshire's have, like with the, you know, four sides and indoor plumbing. No, it was not a hut. It was a trail shelter, which is a three-sided wooden building. Uh, that's usually filled with hikers and sometimes filled with mice, too. But there I was, 
lying on the floorboards of the shelter in my sleeping bag and I just was shivering, shivering to try to keep warm and I went to sleep that night listening to the sound of rain on the shelter roof and the next morning when I woke up, the first thought that went through my head was, oh, I don't hear rain on the shelter roof anymore. It must have stopped. And then I looked outside. Snow. That's right. Six to eight inches of snow had already accumulated on the ground. And, and it was still coming down in like blizzard-like conditions. And I'm from the southeast, okay? So, so snow is like my Achilles heel. I mean, I had never hiked in snow before, and I was supposed to make it out of the park that day. So all I had left to eat in my pack was like a couple spoonfuls of peanut butter and one package of Pop-Tarts. That's all I had left. I was wearing all my clothes and freezing. I did not have what I needed to get stuck in a snowstorm in the Smokies. And also, this is a side note, but like <laughs> growing up in North Carolina, like each spring there are articles that come out in the newspapers about hikers who have to get rescued out of the Smokies in a snowstorm. And so in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, my mother is going to kill me. Like I cannot get rescued out of the Smokies. I cannot be written up in the paper. So I am bound and determined to get out of the park and get to someplace safe. And based on my guidebook, if I can go 18 miles, mostly downhill, I'll reach a road where there's a hiker hostel and I'll be safe. So I immediately start getting packed up and, uh, you know, I'll never forget getting to, getting to my shoes. And I can't, I can't tie or untie my shoes because the laces are just covered with about an inch of ice, right? So it takes several minutes to just stomp them on and I throw on my pack and then I start down the trail. And, and hiking's difficult, we've established this, right? We know that, we went hiking today. But hiking down the Appalachian Trail in a snowstorm is nearly impossible. Why? The blazes are white. The blazes are white. Yeah. So, so there's no footprints. Like, there's no way to tell that I'm on the right trail. And now these white blazes, and this is all forested, right? So they're just painted on these trees, and the trees are covered in snow. So it's taking me forever to make sure I'm on the right trail or at least going in the right direction. But most of the time, Thank goodness the path is in the forest. And in the forest, the trees will somewhat protect you from the wind and the sleet and the snow. Yet at one point, the trail left the forest to go out on a long exposed ridge line. And when I, I left tree cover, I felt the wind and I felt the sleet and snow hitting my face and it burned. Instinctually, I just, I ducked my head and I closed my eye and kept one open, but just walked as quickly as I could to get back into the forest. And when I got there, I, I lifted my head, but something was wrong. I couldn't open my eye. It had frozen shut. Has that happened to any of you all? I mean, this is New Hampshire, right? You guys are hardcore. Has that happened? Yes. It has happened to some of you. It's very disconcerting. I mean, I was there, my eyes stuck, and I had to pick icicles off of my eyelash and wipe frozen crust out of the corner of my eye until I could once again lift my eyelid, regain my sight, and keep hiking down the mountain. And that was a very, very long, scary day of hiking. But by the end of the day, and after taking several wrong turns, I made it to a road with the hostel, and I was safe. But I will always remember what it felt like to try to hike the Appalachian Trail through the Smokies in a snowstorm with one eye frozen shut. <laughs> and I think the irony of the Appalachian Trail for me is that several folks, my mother included, thought it was the most aimless thing I had ever done to go out into the woods. She wanted me to have a job or at least a goal or focus. And it was really the Appalachian Trail that taught me that I wanted direction and I needed vision on and off the trail. I mean, to me, these blazes on the trail became a figurative tool off trail to let me know where I am going in life. So now every week I ask myself, what are the blazes I am working towards this week? Where am I going? Because hiking more than anything else taught me it doesn't matter how hard you try, 
It doesn't matter how hard or how much effort you put forth. If you're headed in the wrong direction, it doesn't matter. And a lot of times that energy is counterproductive and takes you farther away from where you want to go. So my first question for you today is very simple. It's can the trail and can the wilderness help give you purpose and vision in life? And if so, what is it? What are your blazes? You don't have to answer. That's what I love about humanities. These are just questions to think about. But I, I know for me, being in the wilderness was not, only, was not only clarifying, but it helped me know what blazes and what maps I was going to use when I got off the trail, very figuratively. So after making it out of all the cold and all the snow in the first month on the trail, I finally got up to Virginia. And I was excited to be in Virginia because now, for the first time, I, I wasn't just preoccupied constantly with Mother Nature. You know, I wasn't always worried about outrunning a snowstorm or a cold rainstorm. And, and it finally started to feel like spring. It takes a long time to feel like spring on the Appalachian Trail, but now there were wildflowers. Now I was wearing my shorts during the morning. I mean, that felt so liberating, wearing shorts. I don't know, that was a big deal for me. And while I wasn't constantly just preoccupied with the challenges of Mother Nature, I, I started to really embrace and enjoy the human nature aspect of the Appalachian Trail. And I think when you go on the Appalachian Trail, that's one thing that makes it so unique, is you learn as much from the trail community as you do from the wilderness. And I loved meeting new people on the trail. Because it was the first environment I had been a part of where the people who were the closest to me were extremely different from me. Until that time, I had gone through school, and my friends had been similar ages. We had had similar interests. And now, I was hiking this trail, and I might spend half the day with a 70-year-old, and then the second half of the day with a family who had young children. In fact, you guys, I think a lot of you in this room probably know this, but do you want to guess the youngest hiker who's ever done the entire Appalachian Trail? Five. Five. A five-year-old boy did the entire path with his parents. And then the next year, he did the Pacific Crest Trail at age six. Isn't that crazy? And then the, the oldest person to do it all at once, I, I believe, was 82 or 83 when he finished. So a wide range of ages. Um, but the two most common demographics doing the whole trail are going to be folks right out of college and then individuals who have recently retired. Because those are two good times in life to take a four- to six-month hike. And what I discovered is it's a really special combination. You know, as a 21-year-old, first of all, I was relieved to meet other people my age and realize, OK, they don't have their whole lives figured out either. That's good. That's refreshing. But more than that, I was really fortunate to spend a lot of time, a lot of miles with folks in their 50s, 60s, 70s, because they had a lifetime's worth of experience and knowledge and wisdom. And on the trail, they had time. They had time to share their stories. And one of the comments I heard today was, it's amazing how much you learn. It's amazing how quickly you connect to people on the trail. When conversation is your entertainment, you connect very quickly. And it was amazing to hike. You know, to be able to hike with someone for one full day and feel like I knew them as well as, as someone I had known my entire life, that's a gift. And that's the magic of the trail. And a lot of times you don't even know their real name because you're just using trail names. But there was one time <laughs> in Virginia where I, I met a young man around my age. And we walked and talked and had this really interesting conversation. But then, towards the end of the day, like always, I was ready to go off on my own once again. So I tried all my usual partying methods, and nothing seemed to work. Nothing. And I'm from the South where, um, we have a problem sometimes being direct, right? I didn't want to be direct. I did not want to hurt his feelings. So I said, all right, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to give him some hints or clues about how I feel, right? So I remember turning to this other hiker and saying, gosh, you know what? I am so glad that I don't have a hiking partner. <laughs> and then he turned to me and he said, yeah, me too. Oh, 
So I was like, all right, that backfired, but I'll just, I'll try again. And this time I made it really clear. This time I said, okay, gee, you know what? I really like hiking by myself. Pretty clear, right? Sure enough, he turns to me and he goes, yeah, me too. And he continues to follow me. And I try everything I can think of. I mean, I tried going really fast. And I, I can hike pretty fast. But, but he kept up. And I tried going really very slowly. And then he turns out he was very patient. So finally, after nearly a week of this, I mean, he followed me for six days, six full days. And after nearly a week, I was fed up. I was frustrated, and clearly I was desperate. And there is this brief break where I didn't see him right behind me on the trail. So I thought to myself, this is it. You know, like, this is my chance, and I've got to escape. So what are you going to do if you're trying to escape from someone on the Appalachian Trail? Exactly. exactly. You've done this before, right? Run and hide. I mean, that is what came into my mind. I didn't have time to think about it. I just had to act. And so I sprint off trail with my 30 pound pack still on. And then I get down on all fours and I climb underneath a rhododendron tree. Yeah. And I am there face down in the dirt, looking up at the trail and just praying that this guy is gonna pass without seeing me. And then all of a sudden I realize this is the most pathetic I have ever felt in my entire life. I mean, I was out there in the dirt underneath a rhododendron tree trying to avoid probably the only human contact within miles. And like, ultimately, I mean, what would have been worse? Having him find me hiding underneath a rhododendron tree or, or, or being direct and honest and hurting his feelings just a little bit six days prior, right? I mean, ultimately, I decided, I vowed right then and there that I would always be direct, that I would always communicate clearly with other hikers I met on the trail. And, and since then, I've been able to be a lot more upfront, a lot more authentic, not only with other hikers, but also with myself. It was like I wasn't just hiding from him. I was also hiding from my own feelings. So question number two from the trail is what are you hiding from? What makes you go under that rhododendron tree with your pack still on? And how can the wilderness and how can your friends and how can you face your fears? How can all those things work together to help you face your fears? So it took two, two and a half months to get up to Pennsylvania. And as a hiker coming north, Pennsylvania is a really interesting state because on one hand, you've come halfway. You've come over a thousand miles. You're proud. You're ecstatic. I mean, that is awesome. You're in Pennsylvania. But the problem is, you're in Pennsylvania. <laughs> and, and you've come a thousand miles, but it was the hardest thing you've ever done in your entire life, and you still have a thousand miles left to go, you know? And to add to that, Pennsylvania is known on the Appalachian Trail for what? Rattlesnakes. And rattlesnakes, yes, exactly. Rocks, yes, rocks and, and a lot of rattlesnakes, but, but Pennsylvania rocks are just notorious along the trail, and I think they're they're different. They're different than Maine and New Hampshire rocks. You guys have slabs. They have rocks. I mean, every step seems to be on a sharp, jagged edge in Pennsylvania. So your feet hurt, right? But I found also that my neck hurt. Most of the time I can look up and I can enjoy the view. In Pennsylvania, I was looking straight down at my feet all day because I didn't want to trip and fall. So my feet hurt and my neck hurt and I kept telling myself, all right, things will get better when you get out of Pennsylvania. Things will get better when you get farther north. And then I got to the next state and I had the... Um, the hardest day of any hike and one of the hardest days of my life. And most of my stories are really uplifting and good natured, but I think in this setting, it's appropriate to share um, 
this story as well, but something very hard and very tragic happened um, on the trail. I was hiking by myself one morning and I came up to the top of a mountain. And when I arrived, um, I came across a scene where a few minutes earlier, someone had driven up from a nearby town and taken their own life. And I was the first person to arrive. And I was traumatized. I was terrified. And it's funny because, it's not funny, but it's amazing how our minds work because I saw this image for a split second and every time I tell the story, I see it in perfect detail. But I remember I saw it, I felt like my stomach dropped out of my body, I turned and I ran back down the trail to some point where I felt a little more safe. And then I took out my cell phone and just, this is, I know this dates me, but this is 2005 when less than half the hikers carry cell phones and you don't have very good service on the trail. But I had enough to call the local police and eventually they came out and they met me on the trail and it was, it was so strange to be there and be so far away from friends and family and to be with the police officers. And I thought that I would find comfort in the police officers. But when they arrived, they sat down and they were very professional, very businesslike, and they asked me questions for about 15 minutes. And then when they were done with their questions, the exact line the officer said was, okay, you can keep hiking now. I mean, that's what he said. He goes, okay, you can keep hiking now. And not much had changed. I mean, I was still traumatized and I was scared and I wasn't thinking clearly. I wasn't thinking about options. And I'm looking back so grateful that that police officer said, okay, you can keep hiking now. Because since he said that, it seemed like that's what I should do. So I kept walking and in retrospect, I know, I know it's the best thing that I could have done. And here's what I learned from that experience. There is something very, very powerful, and very healing about physical forward motion. After that experience, my mind felt stuck and confused and angry. And that's how my heart and my soul felt. It just felt gridlocked in anger and fear and confusion. But because my body was able to move forward, it gave me this hope that my heart and my mind and my spirit would be able to move forward as well. And it's amazing how many people come to the trail to heal. It's amazing. I mean, Cheryl Stray is probably the most well-known, you know, but um, after divorce, after war, after losing a loved one, it's amazing how many people come to the trail to heal. And beyond the physical forward motion, I think one of the most powerful aspects of the wilderness is that you don't, again, you don't get to hide. It's hard to hide. You have to process what's happened. You have to deal with it. When something bad happens and I'm in my day-to-day -day life, I like to repress it and fill my mind and fill my schedule so I don't have to deal with it. But the trail sort of forces you to deal with it. And then I also, in that moment, because I had been very prideful as a 21-year-old, thinking, I'm a solo hiker. I'm out here by myself. And then that happened. And every hiker who heard about the experience just kind of rushed to my side. And they said, if you want us to hike with you every step till Maine, we will. We'll be by your side every step. If you need space, we'll give you space. If you want food, we'll give you food. And hikers never share food, right? I mean, this was like, all right, okay, I feel supported. Um, but I, I realized I was not a solo hiker. I was not. It doesn't matter if you're hiking by yourself or you're hiking on a group. When you're on the Appalachian Trail and hopefully in life, like you, you're not alone. You're part of a community. And it was that community. It was the people on the trail who were strangers a few weeks, a few days, a few months ago, it was those folks on the trail who gave me the courage to keep hiking. And the third question that I want to pose to you all today is two parts. One, what can the wilderness help you heal from? 
what can you walk out? What pain or struggle or strife can you help heal with a hike? And then B, who can help you do it as well? So after that, <laughs> I already mentioned I was a little prideful when I started out. It's funny, a lot of people come to the trail to be healed. I think a lot of people also come to the trail without knowing that they need to be humbled. And I feel like as a 21-year-old, I needed to be humbled. So <laughs> at that point, though, I hadn't quite gotten there because after the snowstorm and after the stalker and, and now a suicide, like, I felt pretty entitled. I was like, I've been through a lot out here. Like, I have given this trail a whole lot of emotional investment, and I would like a red carpet and roses all the way to Katahdin, please. Like, I need it to get better. And then I got up to Massachusetts, and by the way, up until Massachusetts, I had only had two bug bites the entire trip. <laughs> Pretty good. You know where I'm going with this, though, yeah? My first day in MA, I got 137 mosquito bites. And I counted twice. <laughs> so 137 mosquito bites. And that was before getting up into Vermont and discovering the black fly. The black fly. We don't have, I mean, I thought a black fly was a big buzzing fly. I didn't know it was this tiny biting vampire that can get under your clothes and in your chair and just travels in, in hordes and clouds because that's what a black fly does, right? So now I'm in Vermont. I've come through 12 states. And it's not cold. It's not snowing. There's no one following me. It's not really that rocky, but it is hot. It's humid. And I am surrounded by a cloud of black flies. I only have two states left to go. And all I want to do is quit. I want to go home. And I actually got to the next road crossing. I didn't need to resupply but I went into the next town. I mean, I was just very sincerely thinking about whether I would keep going or not. And I got a motel room. And <laughs> it was actually really lame because I checked in really early and I was far away from town and there was nothing to do. And I remember I watched the MTV Music Awards for like four hours. It was just on rerun. <laughs> And if you ever need motivation to get back on the trail, you should watch the MTV <laughs> Music Awards because I mean, in my mind, it was funny. The thing that kept coming into my mind was everything seems so fake and exaggerated and sensationalized. Like nothing is as real as going out and seeing the sunset and hearing the birds and smacking the black flies off my body. Like it hurts and it's hard, but it's real. Like it is real. It's not fake. And so now I have this, this issue of... If I go back to the trail, which I wanted to do, I wanted to keep hiking, but in my mind I said, something has got to change. I mean, this whole trail, I've told myself, it's going to get better. That's what I said in Georgia and North Carolina and Tennessee when it was freezing cold. That's what I said when I was trying to get away from some awkward people in Virginia. That's what I said in the rocks. That's what I said in New Jersey. That's what I said with the bugs in Massachusetts. I said, at some point it's going gonna, it's gonna to be easy. It's going to be fine. I'm going to have sunshine and great views. It took me to Vermont. <laughs> it took me to Vermont to realize that the trail is innately difficult. It was never going to be easy. If it was easy, then more than 25% of the folks who started the trail would finish. The trail was going to be difficult, and I could not control nature. Obvious. Obvious statement. So hard to accept as a 21-year-old. I mean, I had this false sense of control where I got to, got to control what temperature it was inside a room and what I wore and how much I ate. I had food and water, everything available all the time. I just had this false sense of control, really. And it took 1,700 miles on the Appalachian Trail to make me realize I'm not in control. I cannot control my environment. I cannot change my environment. The only thing I can control is my response and my attitude. And it's so simplistic, but for me on the first hike, that made all the difference. Because we all know the two hardest states on the trail, right? New Hampshire. Maine and New Hampshire. And on my first journey, they were the best. They were not easy. They were the most difficult, but they were the best because finally I realized 
I couldn't fight the trail. I had to just flow with it. I had to take what the trail was giving and make the best out of it. And so the fourth question today is just on and off the trail. Think about what you can change and what you can't control. It's very simple. I think <laughs> on the trail I've learned that I'm not in control of my environment, but I have to relearn it off the trail all the time. Not in control of business. I can control my attitude and my response, but I can't always control the people around me or the things around me. So five months, five months of hiking brought me to Katata. And uh, I got to the end and um, first of all, never thought I would do another long trail again at that point. Mm -hmm. I was tired and ready to take a shower and go home. <laughs> but I also knew right away I was a different person. I knew I was a different person and I liked the woman at the end so much more than the girl who had started. And um, a lot of things changed. I mean, a lot of things you heard me mention along the way had, had changed me. But I think it's also very telling to share a few of the things I missed the most when I got off trail. I think that's indicative of how I changed along the way. And so I, I want to let you know that right away I missed um, the simplicity. I miss the simplicity of the trail. I mean, it was just contrasted that we're in this culture and society where we think stuff makes you happy. And then I got off trail and I realized literally the, the less stuff I have and collect, the more, the more things I can do, the more adventures I can have. And that changed the rest of my life. I mean, it really did. I learned that if I invest in people and adventures over things, I'm gonna be a lot happier. And then, you know, before I started hiking the Appalachian Trail, I, I was terrified that I was going to go out there and I was going to be bored and lonely. And when it was over, right away, I longed for the silence and the solitude that I had discovered. And, uh, you know, the AT taught me that there's a real big difference between, between being alone and feeling lonely. Because I actually felt a lot more lonely at college in big classrooms or football stadiums where there are tons of people around me and I didn't feel like I connected with any of them. But being on the trail with one person, a few, pre a few people, or, or just being by myself, that, that never felt lonely. I mean, it was the first time in my life I actually felt peace. I thought, I guess in my mind, I thought boredom and peace were kind of related. They're not. <laughs> They're not related. Maybe they are. But either way, I don't know. It's just... Silence and solitude are not very common in our society, and they're some of the best medicine we have. Like, they really are. They're just really powerful. So I, I miss that. And I also miss my friends because I spent about half the trail on my own and half with other people. And again, those friends were so quirky and different, and it just made me a better person to spend time with them. Investing in other people really is a way of investing in yourself. And then the thing I miss most of all, it doesn't seem to make sense, um, and I try to mention this in every talk because it is so important to me, but what I miss most about hiking is how beautiful I felt on the trail. And again, it doesn't seem to make sense because when I was on the trail, I was dirty, right? Filthy, covered in bug bites, scrapes, and bruises. We won't even talk about the smell, but for, <laughs> for five months, I didn't carry a mirror. Again, this is before the day of the selfie, so I wasn't doing that all day. And I didn't have billboards or magazines or commercials telling me what I should look like. So I started to see myself in a whole new way. And I started to see myself through my interactions with other hikers. So like, if I was kind or funny, if I made someone else smile, that was my reflection. That made me feel pretty. And growing up, I had always thought, yeah, sure, nature is beautiful. We can all agree on that, right? Nature, look out the window, it is beautiful. But here's the thing. 
I had never seen myself as a part of nature. And I had never seen myself as a part of all that beauty until I hiked the trail. And after walking over 2,000 miles and coming through 14 states, you better believe that I based my self-worth a whole lot less on how I looked and a whole lot more on what I could do. And that's one of the most powerful things about the trails. It makes you realize that you can do so much more than you once thought was possible. And I hope that you all leave here today with that feeling and the knowledge that you can do so much more than you once thought was possible on and off the trail. And that's all I have to say, really. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs>feel so ridiculous giving a talk after a hike because seriously like what you need to learn is on the trail <laughs> like I can't I can't top that um, but I do have a lot of um, valuable experiences and I'd be happy if any of you guys have any questions maybe we can do a few minutes of questions is that okay Kathy yes how did you get through your most miserable moments you know I at the end of the day, I think miserable moments cause you to question what's important to you, right? And that can be a very clarifying process. Sometimes the miserable moments give you more resolve than you had prior to being miserable. An example is I, I got through a lot of miserable moments on my own when I started backpacking and I forgot how miserable they were. And then I started backpacking with my husband and all of a sudden he was like, whoa, this is hard. You know, he was like, this is tough. I don't know that I signed on for this. And we did this one trail where it rained for two straight days. And my husband said, all right, if it rains for another 24 hours, like you can keep going, that's cool, this is your thing, I support you, but I am, I'm done, I'm done, I'm getting off. Okay, poured, poured the next 24 hours. And I knew, all day I just knew, I knew he was gonna leave that night. And, um, and at the end of the day, he, he just started setting up his tent in the rain and getting ready to go to bed. And, and I asked, I thought, you know, I thought you were gonna quit. And he, he looked at me and his teeth just grimaced and he's like, I've given too much to give up now. You know, like I've given too much to give up now. And that was a short answer, I think, I think hardship on the trail does teach you endurance but at the end of the day um, you know with my husband in that example I think we wanted to be together more than apart I think he wanted to keep going until it stopped raining to prove he could and I he loves he loves walking and he loves nature and um, it took some really you know tough rain to make him realize how much he was willing to go through to get that end result but yeah, I think uh, Called Again is a good example of the book about the record. I ask myself that every day. Like, why am I doing this? Why am I hurting? It's so hard. It's 47 miles a day. I can be outdoors and I can just sit and get the benefits of nature. So why do I feel like I need to hike 47 miles a day? Um, and the answer for me that summer was, you know, I feel, like I, have, I feel like hiking is a gift for me. Just like someone who loves art or loves dance or love sports, like I hike and I feel like I have a gift, like I feel alive, like I, I'm proud of being a hiker, like it makes me, I don't, it makes me feel unique, it makes me feel special, I feel like I'm good at it, and I wanted to know what 100% was, and, uh, and I feel like it's like the Prefontaine, who is a runner, he's like to, you know, I can't remember the quote, but it's basically like, don't waste the gift, like if you, love something, if you're passionate at it, if you think you're good at it, like, don't waste the gift. Um, so it was that, and it was a, a true, like, um, wanting to work efficiently as a team was really important to me with my husband and team, and then, like, someone said earlier, I know, we were talking about the Grand Canyon, he's like, people go rim to rim to rim, they can not enjoy it, they don't enjoy it, and I was like, well, they don't see the details, like it's different, it's different, but there's a beauty in movement. And I felt that beauty. Like I felt this efficiency and lightness and grace that it's sort of, again, like I would compare it to dancing. Like there was a beauty in the, 
in the efficiency and the grace and the movement. And I think it's really rare to feel something that artistic and like that beautiful. And it's also really rare to live a dream. And dreams aren't always easy, but that whole summer I knew, I was like, this is, this is my dream and I'm getting to live it. And so it's hard and it hurts, but I'm gonna keep, gonna keep going. I'm not gonna take that for granted. Long answer, sorry, yeah. What did you read on the trail? The record, I didn't read anything. Um, I'm honestly, I journaled on the trail. I, I um, brought a Bible and I read that at night. I journaled. I, um, when I hike with my husband, we will read out loud. Um, so fun kind of vignette books, like we'll do David Sedaris, which always makes us laugh on the trail. Um, <clears throat> I usually just also pick up books that, um, like I was out on the Continental Divide Trail. I finished up a business book, and then I picked up a book at a thrift store for like 50 cents. You know, I don't, I don't necessarily have a genre. I just try to find kind of light paperbacks <laughs> to take on the trail. That's what I read. Other questions? Yeah. Do you think you will ever hike it again? Yeah, I would. Yeah, I do. I think I will. So I'm section hiking the Continental Divide Trail right now. Like that's my big kind of goal. I spend two weeks a year doing that. And, um, and I, I totally get, again, with the record, like if I was doing the trail once, I wouldn't want to do a record. And there's this saying among through hikers who do the whole trail, like last one to Katahdin wins. And I totally get that. Like I get that mentality that you want to embrace it and be out there and not rush through the experience. But I think last one to Katahdin wins only applies if you're doing one hike. Like I want to have a lifelong relationship with the trail and do it in as many different ways as possible. And I'm never really at Katahdin. Like I'm always on the journey, you know? So I'm still working, still working on the Appalachian Trail. I do a lot of day hikes, would love to do it again, you know, maybe as a retiree someday if I make it that long. Um, maybe my husband's working on it in sections right now. I don't know if my daughter would want to hike any, but that would be fun to do as well. So I would, I, I think, yes, I will probably, hopefully, hike it again maybe a couple times, but no time in the near future. Any other? Yeah, sorry. That's okay. Um, I had a question about trail names. Yes. Where did, how did those come about? And um, so trail names are a fun tradition, a part of the culture on the Appalachian Trail. I bet we have trail names in here. Anyone have a trail name? Are you willing to share? Is it appropriate teach mm -hmm. because you're a teacher? Mm -hmm. Did someone give it to you? Yep. So how they come about? Who has has a name? Oh, what is it? For me, Blue Eyes. Somebody gave that to me. Yeah. I named myself Octo. Octo? Mm -hmm. Why? Oh, cool. <laughs> That's awesome. Do you think you need before you do the trail? Okay, this is good. Let's talk about trail names. I think they're a fun tradition, yeah. right? So there shouldn't be like hard and fast rules about them. Some hikers disagree. Like some hikers would say, you can't name yourself. Or they would say, well, if someone gives you a trail name, that's your trail name forever. And I'm like, no, I believe in veto power too. You know, and I'm like, for example, my first week on the trail, because hikers love to try and give other hikers on the AT their trail name. And my first week out there, I'm six feet tall. I've been six feet tall since eighth grade. And all of a sudden, everyone's like, oh, oh, we got your trail name. It, 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 go by Sasquatch. You know, like, go by, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, awesome. Go by Amazon, Stretch, Slinky. Like, uh, and all of a sudden, all these old wounds from middle school are just, like, ripped open. And I was like, no. Um, so I vetoed all those names. And then, humanities, shout out. I was a classics major in college and was comparing the trail to Homer's Odyssey. So another hiker said, well, what about the trail name Odysseus, which I liked, but I was really proud to be a woman on the trail. I kind of wanted a feminine trail name. So we changed Odysseus to Odissa, and I've been Odissa on every hike, every trail since, and that's the title of my first book, Becoming Odissa. And that's me. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. What do you think of the fellow who um, set the new record, having this big party on top of Catan? Oh, controversial <laughs> question. Um, so I no longer hold the record on the Appalachian Trail. Someone beat it by three hours. Three hours this summer. 
and he did a wonderful thing and it was um, very difficult and very impressive and unfortunately at this point it's more known for a celebration on top of Baxter Peak on Katahdin and so how do I feel? I feel like it's sad it's gotten so much attention. Um, not, I, I, I think Scott, the athlete who broke the record, is a great athlete and I think he's a fantastic person and tries to be a very good ambassador for the trail and for conservation. I know how I felt at the end of my record. I wasn't thinking. I didn't have a big party, but I wasn't thinking. I wasn't coherent. I was exhausted. I was a zombie. I was out of it. I think if really there's anyone to blame, which I don't like to point fingers, but his, his sponsors should have been more aware of the regulations at Baxter. Um, that said, I still, like within this community of outdoor recreationalists and conservationists, I always like to, you know, remind folks that we're on the same team. Like Scott loves the outdoors and he wants people to get outdoors and protect the outdoors. Baxter loves the outdoors. They love Maine. They love Katahdin. They want people to protect it. And I think it, it would just be who of all of us to like really focus on working together as opposed to against one another. And they had conflict. They, there was wrong that was done on the mountain, but I also think it could have been handled, um, yeah, more internally. I don't think, I don't think the national controversy did much good for hikers or conservationists. Um, so that was disappointing. I think maybe it was blown out of proportion. But it might have been driven. Isn't there like a, a subset of people up in Maine that maybe want to turn Baxter into a, a national park as opposed to a state park or some? I don't know all the conspiracy theories for it. I mean, I'm all about like if Baxter has rules, like you follow the rules, right? Or you accept the consequences and say you're sorry. And people are people and people make mistakes. And that's all good. Um, and I know like there is concern now that a lot of through hikers are being too rowdy at Katahdin or partying. And I think, okay, great, like that's an issue and now we know about it and let's address it. And there are, very, there are a lot of ways to address it through education or through permit systems at the end, or there's a lot of ways we can solve the problem. But all of a sudden it just kind of exploded into, we're gonna move the Appalachian Trail. And I was like, I mean, the Appalachian Trail is federally mandated to end at Katahdin. So I think it's gonna take more than, you know, a bottle of champagne at the end to, to really change the northern terminus. But I do think we can always do better as hikers, um, as people. And, and again, I, I don't, I think Scott did something really wonderful and really amazing. And if I can say that about someone who broke my record, like I would hope people would look at the good that he's done for engagement and conservation and not hold, like he didn't sleep at all the last week. Yes, yeah, sponsors, okay, they should maybe have a little more um, responsibility at the end and what went down. But um, again, I think I think that could have been used more cohesively and more for the good of of everyone than it was. That's my feeling. Which way is it uh, easier to set a record going north or going, going south? So I definitely wanted to go south because I was like, I'm getting through Maine and New Hampshire in the beginning. Because if you're getting, you can get knocked off because of weather up here and I almost did. Um, Scott didn't know the trail. He went north and he was super lucky because he had great weather up here, you know. Maybe I, I think knowing the trail, you want to go south. <laughs> I think ignorance is bliss if you're going north. Like maybe if you haven't done the trail before, you're not as worried about Maine and New Hampshire. But I don't know that one's better than the other. It's just honestly, if you're going to get knocked off, I would rather get knocked off on week two than week, you know, seven or whatever. What do you think about the new movie that's out um, into the wild? Uh, I wanted to love it. I don't love it. I don't. Do you think it'll affect? No, I think I left the movie theater. I'm like, we don't have to worry about impact. <laughs> like, um, I like the book a lot. I mean, I think Bill Bryson's funny. He's a humorist. You know, like he's not uh, someone who did the whole trail. Like, just take it for what it is. He's funny. He's a good writer. Um, the movie I was excited about. I was like, it's going to showcase the AT, and this is awesome. And Wild was was a very moving story with a very hard past that it had to address. And A Walk in the Woods is kind of lighthearted and fun, so I was excited about this new spin on long distance hiking. But I just didn't, I just didn't love it. I just. I haven't seen it yet. How, who's seen it? 
Did you love it? No. I mean, I want someone to be like, go see it. I loved it. It was great. I don't know if I'm too picky because I'm too much of a hiker and I want to be like the art director and make them do it right, you know, like, <laughs> but um, yeah, there were just artistically, there were things that bugged me. I didn't think it was very, yes. Yeah, I didn't love it. I'm not saying it's not worth seeing, but don't go, I had such high expectations. I was saying this earlier, I got a babysitter. Like if you get a babysitter, <laughs> It's got to be good. It's like got to be twice as good as it was before kids, you know, because you're paying twice as much literally for it. I don't, so maybe the bar was just too high, really. <laughs> I don't know. Um, maybe a technical question. I've read some of your work, and I've heard you speak before, and I hear you talk of, and then I read the first two chapters of Called Again. So I've heard you recount some pretty intense physical discomfort. Yeah. And my mantra is, I will not be a rescue story. So I realize I probably err on the side of caution each and every time. But, yeah. You know, this needs, I can't keep moving forward yeah. is what I think you'd recommend. What is your edge? How do you know it? And can you talk about that a little bit? Ooh. Um, I've never had to be rescued. I've never had to have been rescued. <laughs> I think that's good. Um, if you are going to get rescued, get rescued in a national park because I hear it's free. That's the word on the street from hiking friends. <laughs> like you don't, you're not responsible in a national park. That doesn't really address your question, but I think I try to make smart decisions. That was a struggle. That was a tension on the record because I had to keep going. Like if you have bad weather in the whites, you hunker down, right? Um, I had bad weather up here and I kept going thinking I have great gear. I know, I know how to listen to my body. I can stop at a hut. I know the roots, like all these things. I felt like I was prepared for bad weather and still, maybe that was a false sense of control because then because bad weather you know can win um i don't i don't think it's an edge i try to be really conservative honestly i do and i've made bad i've made mistakes in the past and i haven't had to pay for them with a bad injury or an illness i've had to pay with moderate hypothermia um, too, which was suggested for today, um, of, of Caldean talks about your knee injury. Oh, yeah. I mean, that, when you're describing the degree of swelling and discomfort and movement, I was Oh, yeah, it was on the long trail. You could walk through that. Okay, well, one thing I do love about hiking is, like, all of a sudden, you're so connected to your body. You're so connected to your body. And I basically, anytime I have an injury, I don't assess how bad it is right away. I try to get up. I try to walk on it. And to me, there's, like... When you have injuries, if it gets worse right away or in time, you get off. If it stays the same, you can kind of keep going and see what happens. If it gets better, then it's probably going to continue to get better. Um, it's also amazing just like how you can heal your body by laying off mileage, by giving it proper medicine or rest, by doing things like even just sticking a swollen knee or leg or ankle in a cold stream for 20 minutes. Like, I don't, like... I'm much more aware of my body and how to treat it and what it needs because of long distance hiking. And that was part of being very self-sufficient. And then I also am fortunate to have a wilderness first responder certification. So I spent two weeks learning wilderness medicine and how to treat and when to evac. Um, and I have had to help other people evac, have assisted with other rescues. But, um, and you know, as much time as I spend outdoors, I might need to get rescued at some point. But I hope that I have, like today, we had the hike, and I brought a um, sleeping bag and a tarp because I thought if anyone hurts their ankle, like, we're going to be exposed. It's going to be windy. Like, I want to make sure we have the right things until someone – I mean, rescues are a power to backcountry adventure, but you want to still be smart and make sure you're minimizing the risk whenever you go out. And I haven't always been a perfect, perfect example, but I think I get better and tend to be conservative, really. I mean, our hiking company in, in Asheville, we cancel so many trips because of the threat of thunder and lightning and bad weather and pretty conservative. We probably want to hike today. No, I'm just kidding. It was great. It was great. Can you repeat your three questions that you asked back then? So I want you to think about, first of all, like what are your blazes off trails? What's your life map? Um, I want you to think about what you're hiding from and how you can be more direct and honest and authentic, um, or maybe who you're hiding from. I um, want you to think how, what, how the wilderness can help you heal uh, and what you need to heal from and who can help with that. And then 
Did I ask that fourth question? Yeah. Differentiate That's good. I was like, did I forget to ask that? Yeah. So differentiate between what you can control and what you can change. And there is a great, I grew up going to Catholic school, and there's this really great, whether you say it as a prayer or mantra, it's grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, courage to change the things I can, and wisdom to know the difference. And that helps so much with adaptability. Um, so I think that's important. Those are my questions. So, it might be a, yeah, it's a good time. It's a good, time. To end it's a good wrap up. Thank you. Hey. So